Welcome everyone to the Human Everywhere podcast. I am one of your co-hosts today, Jason Bott. Human Everywhere is a production of Deep Space Predictive Research Group. Deep Space Predictive focuses on the psychological and social connections of human space flight. Human Everywhere asks us to pause and look towards the future of space and remind us that the human element, the human experience is the critical piece of exploring space, that wherever we go, everywhere, we are human first. It's beyond propulsion, it's beyond engineering, it's about the human condition. My co-hosts today are Ubi Simieri and Aliris Allman, and I'll turn that over to them to introduce themselves. Hello, hello. Aliris, you want to go first this time? I think I went first last time. (laughs) Oh, sure. Great. (laughs) Hey everyone, how are you doing? I am Alira Salman and I am the founder of Deep Space Predictive and I'm really excited to have our conversation with uh, our guest today, which I have you be introduced, but um, really excited to just learn another person's experience with space. Yeah, the same. I, I'm Yuvaldo Simonetti. Everybody calls me Yubi, uh, like Yubi 40. It's a great, great band if you haven't heard of them. Um, and But yeah, you know, it's, it, uh, we're exploring what it means to be human, uh, not just here on Earth, but as we move out into the universe. And I mean, frankly, a lot of those things don't change. They shouldn't change. Um, and But we have to be cognizant of them as we continue to build around that and, and build ways for us to expand out into the universe because we're human. We take that wherever we go. And so uh, without focusing on that and keeping the human in the loop, as we like to say it, it, we're just building stuff and things won't, things won't go well. (laughs) Um, So anyway, very excited to be here and very excited to have Bailey Burns, who I had the pleasure of meeting in Paris last year of all places at IAC, which was amazing. That was sort of my first intro into the space industry. So Bailey, welcome to the show and tell us all about you. Well, thank you. Yeah, well, I've, it's such an honor to be able to say I know all three of you. I think that's really cool. Uh, we've met everyone in person. So, um, but yes, hi, everyone. My name is Bailey Burns. Um, I am an aerospace engineer. I work for Blue Origin, and I basically do human things in space, like everything human I'm concerned with. Um, I'm a systems engineer, which means I do a lot of like the interface and how does this all work together. Uh, But my background is in uh, life support. So it's called ECLIS, Environmental Control and Life Support Systems. So that's oxygen, pressure control, CO2 removal, water, all those things that humans we, we have here on Earth. And thank you, Earth, for giving us these things. But now we need to learn how to do this in space. Um, and then I'm also moving my career into the direction of EVA, which is the giant white spacesuits, um, crew systems, which is beds, toilets, medical equipment, food, those kinds of things. Also, everything humans need to be not just alive in space, but happy in space and lunar dust mitigation, because that is one of the biggest issues with the moon. So it's basically if there's a human involved, I'm probably thinking about it in some way. <laughs> That's amazing. And I, so when you, you talk about life support, right, like life in space, how much do you talk about the stuff we're kind of talking about, which is like the social interactions, the interpersonal relationships, how much does that come in? Because I know a lot of the other stuff is more technical and, mm-hmm. and like actual like biological life saving things, but how much does the other stuff come in? Um, it, it does, it's in there. It's in there. I, and yeah. that's one of my goals. The reason I'm here. Hi, everyone. Is because <laughs> I want to bring that into the story a little bit more. I can say for like the ECLIS, the life support systems. Um, that's, I mean, it's, it's pumps and valves. My undergraduate degree is in mechanical engineering. So that's why that kind of ties in and I understand that stuff. Uh, but really what it comes down to what we're talking about is more on the crew system side and the EVA side, which is why I'm excited to dive into that area. Um, but all of it is very much at the end of the day, con ops, it's the concept of operations, it's end user, how do they see it? And that gets into a little bit more of what we're talking about, especially in harsh environments of, okay, when something's going wrong, how do humans respond to that? How can we make sure that we make it easier for them? How can we make sure the engineer design is easy for humans to use in extreme situations? So I think that's the most um, that I've seen these conversations come in. Um, We really only have the ISS right now for, 
uh, living in space. And so as we expand, as we finally have a moon base, as we finally have more space stations and we start seeing this kind of interconnective, it's going to be, I mean, we're going to need specialists in every area to start talking about this yeah. stuff. Yeah. You know, one of the things, um, you know, I love how you're, you're, you're focusing on making sure the body is alive, that the people can do the work. It's the next level to understand, okay, we've done this, but how do we do it? And how does that impact the, the interpersonal relationships? Because you can make sure that the, you know, the systems work. We know how the systems integrate. We've made it easy for you to understand. But if I don't like you, I'm not going to do my job to make your job easier. <laughs> and that's the part. I think that's the part where we we are we start to dip into things that make us uncomfortable because we don't, because you go into a situation where it's it's great because we all want to make this work. But how you make it work is my idea better than your idea. And you know, what are ways that you integrate some of the human interpersonal issues into the systems that you're building? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I think really what it comes down to is as engineers, we, we typically, uh, we, get, we get so excited about uh, the thing we're building and, and yeah. making it work. And, and that's very exciting and very important. Um, but you, you have to be really cognizant and along the way it doing human in the loop testing and getting someone in there to say, oh, no, my, my arm does not reach that far. I cannot reach that. Or uh, for me, I, for those of you that don't know, I know we're all in little boxes, but um, I, I'm short. And so I, b being able to say, hey, I can't see that. Just so you guys know, this isn't designed for someone who is below the average height. Um, you can't do that. Once the thing's designed, it's designed. It's really expensive to design it. So it's about like starting as soon as you start having an idea, throwing humans in there and seeing how it actually works and, and you know, how, how humans feel about it and the different types of humans that might be using it. Um, just figuring out that you have to do that early in the design process. Because if you do that later, everyone's like, well, let's just design it. And then we can, can start figuring out how to include people. And so if you're going to do that, it's going to be expensive. People aren't going to want to worry about it. You have to start almost as soon as you start designing the thing, start bringing humans into how they're going to use it. Well, it was, it's, it's fascinating. There was um, uh, stories back when they first started to develop and design fighter jets, right? They mm -hmm. sort of, they built the cockpits and everything based on the average human. Well, mm -hmm. there's no average human, right? So, <laughs> so numerous people died because nothing worked. Nothing was within reach, right? And mm -hmm. uh, I just, I think that's really fascinating. And I'm glad we learned that lesson when we did. Um, but to your point, it's like, well, let's start with building the spaceship and then we'll bring, you know, the humans on board. But that's, that, that, that seems a little counterintuitive because there's going to be frustration, like all the emotions, you know, we, it's like, we didn't necessarily think about those early on because there's going to be emotions to that. And, and what if I have a headache? Like I'm going to be grumpy. <laughs> or if I'm hangry, right? Like all those things play into that. And it's like, I always worry we don't think enough about that. Um, and, and I think that's important because th those are the things that trip us up, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and when you're designing these things, when you're designing the operations, you have to take into consideration the frustration because, I mean, I've seen it in my own experience. I've done two tasks, one when I was, tired and exhausted one when I was feeling better and um during that time I was giving like how I was feeling and you can see the difference between those two like you can see that it was easier for me to perform it when I was feeling better and so designing things so that the human can be at their best self they can be not frustrated or if they are frustrated how to mitigate that and, and you know get them back down to where we're very focused on what's going on sleep uh, water. So you mentioned headaches. One of the biggest issues for space is CO2, right? Like high CO2 levels and that leads to headaches. So figuring out how to mitigate all this stuff. So we're really focusing on giving the human their best chance of success by mitigating all this other stuff that even here on earth, we have to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things you talk about CO2, which reminds me where we last met, because baby, I was <laughs> you when you were just a young engineer. I know. 
<laughs> at the you very beginning. You told me the whole story, yeah. I know. I'm lo- and I'm loving how you're blossoming and evolving your journey into your career. Um, and one of the things we just met recently, which was last month, is it? it's June time. That's another thing we got to talk about is time. Uh, you know, last month was the analog astronaut. You were the first part of the first analog group in a very unique crew going into um, the SAM in the biosphere. Tell us a little bit about that experience because that's taking everything you've learned and putting it in like the ultimate human in the loop in testing. What was that like? That was an amazing experience. Um, I've done two analogs now. I'm, you know, now, now I've got the bugs. So I've got like three more on the horizon that I want to figure out how to make work. So, um, but this this analog specifically, we were the shakedown crew. We were the first crew. We were seeing how it all worked. Wow. Um, the facility, as you mentioned, it's at Biosphere too. So if you, if you don't know anything about Biosphere, too, that's a whole nother project to look into. They 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 were fascinating um, back in the the 80s and 90s. Uh, they they sealed themselves into this massive. Uh, environment for almost two years. The first crew was there for almost two years. Um, and so basically after all this time has passed, we're, you know, 30 years later, the, there's a test module that they did um, because what they designed is an engineering feat, but they had a smaller test module where they tested all their ideas and they actually had Linda uh, live in it, talking about keeping humans in the loop early on. She lived in it and see to see how it goes. And basically that was taken, refurbished, adds add-ons, and now it's in an analog. It's an analog environment. And the, the team down there did a great job of like the engineering is incredible. But the interesting thing about this analog is that it's pressurized. It's pressurized to slightly over what we feel. So like maybe half a PSI, a tenth of a PSI. It's very slightly pressurized. Uh, but we need to have a constant inflow of air to make sure we have oxygen. We have CO2 pockets. We need the, the the air going out. It's an open loop system. Eventually, it can be closed loop where you can just seal everyone in truly like a spacecraft and figure out how to live. Like, it's very different um, from my first analog in Hawaii where it, you know, we you, you could just walk out the door. And in this case, you couldn't. It was pressurized. So you had to depress and then leave and everything like that. And of course, there's safety procedures and everything if there is a true emergency. Um, so the, the environment itself, as a, as a life support engineer, as an ecos engineer, that was like living on a playground. It was so much fun to just kind of see how all these things work together. Um, and being part of the shakedown crew, part of the first crew going in there, that, that was one of our jobs is to figure out, hey, this does not work. Hey, you need this. That was part of the, the deal. And because of that, we were in a little bit more of a harsher environment than probably crews down the line because we were finding mm-hmm. those human in the loop. Where did we forget about this? And um, I can tell you, like, I mean, the, the, the experience was great. I can't say enough good things. But when you start having these things, when you start finding the areas that you're used to having and you're now lacking, it does lead to like, you have to be able to regulate your emotions. You have to be able to openly talk about what's going on with your crew. Um, you have to be able to say, okay, I'm feeling this way. And I know that I'm feeling this way and I can feel it like making my brain fuzzy with frustration, exhaustion, those different things. And being able to take a step back and say, okay, for, for me, what do I do when I start feeling this way? I start reading, I start journaling, I meditate. And those are the things that I had to lean on more than I expected um, to help regulate when I started feeling those extremes. Well, I love that you're using meditation and first of all, you have self-awareness, right? Something is a little off here. I need to to get myself back on track and you use meditation, you use journaling, these very uh, non-digital mm-hmm. mechanisms for recalibrating yourself. And I think that's important for people to understand that you have to be so self-aware to be able to manage the bigger pieces of that. Oh, a hundred percent. If you're not, it, it, it's it's almost like your job because if I were to go into these situations and not have any clue about that, not know I'm just angry, that kind of stuff, it it's it's a burden on my other crew members. It's almost like your job to clean up what's going on inside of you so that you can be a good team member, so you can have a successful mission. How how were these two analogs different? I mean, obviously, you know, the the, the purpose was different, but from an experience for you. What were the big differences coming out of that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So there's a really good quote. Um, I actually don't know who said it. I wish I could credit them, but it's just something that I've really resonated with. Um, But if you leave an analog, the same person you were when you went into it, you did the analog wrong. That's the only way you can do an analog wrong is if you like, if you don't learn something. And um, I think both of the analogs have a profound impact on my career. 
I can't speak to this last one as much because I'm still in the um, processing growing mm-hmm. phase. I'm still like figuring out what exactly I, I'm taking from it. But I can tell you from the last analog, um, I went into it. If I can do this, I can be an astronaut. Like that was like, if I, I'm proving, I came in with a very large chip on my shoulder and I can say that now, like humbly. <laughs> I didn't know that yeah. at the time, but it was very much, if I can do this, I can become an astronaut. And so as a result, I put a lot of pressure on myself to prove that I could be an astronaut. I was very young. I was the youngest of my crew. Um, I think I was, let's see, when, when was that? That was, it was actually in the middle of the pandemic. So I was, I think like 24, 25 at the time, very new into my career. Um, and basically the rest of the crew, if they weren't, if they didn't have a doctor, like a doctorate or something, they had already done analogs or they were running a company or they worked at NASA and they were already very impressive people. And I came in really feeling like I had to prove myself. These people didn't really respect me. I mean, I haven't talked to them. You can talk to the crew now and I'm sure they would say that wasn't the case, but the story I made up in my mind was very much, um, they, they think I'm a child. They think I'm here for the Instagram pictures. And like I said, you go talk to them. They don't, I, they, we all have a great relationship now, but it impacted my experience. And the first week I was absolutely miserable. I was just felt like I was running uphill on a treadmill. <laughs> like it was just not going anywhere. And uh, fortunately we're able to email. We don't usually have like internet and stuff like mm. that, but we're able to email. And so I emailed my mom and, you know, mom saved the day. And she said, you know, whenever you're feeling this way, you meditate. And so I had a very profound meditation um, on like the halfway mark. And I just, something in my brain was like, well, Bailey, even if they do believe that of you, you're wasting your time here by being so miserable. And the second half, I just flipped the switch. It was amazing. The relationships grew. I learned so much more. And from that point on, it started this journey of, um, I need, like I said, I need to clean up me. I'm physically ready to be an astronaut. I proved it in that sense. But mentally at that point in time, I was not ready. I was, I was, I thought I was, I was not ready. And it's, it's led to this, I mean, so far three years of insane personal growth of um, learning about mindfulness, finding my spirituality, um, learning how to work with teams, learning about myself and what my boundaries are so that if a team member does cross it, um, I can like not put it on them. We can talk about it, open communication, all these things that I, I frankly had never thought about in my life. And not only is it helping me with my career and my dreams of becoming an astronaut, but it's helping my my personal life as well. Um, and that was tied to my first analog. Uh, like I, it's almost one of those where you can see night and day, the differences of who I was before that and who I came out and who I'm becoming now. Hmm. That is, I mean, that is the whole like awareness of what we're trying to bring with human everywhere, yeah. because those are, I don't think people think about that aspect. Mm-hmm. And the fact that you had that awareness and you you took some steps to learn because you really don't know what it is that's throwing you off. And it's this interpersonal mm-hmm. piece because as an engineer, as someone who goes into an analog, you want the mission to be successful. You want to make sure you do the task that's on your list every day. And that's the important part. But it's that other piece that just so impacts and I love to hear I love your story about growth because growth is not easy <laughs> and you just talked about <laughs> that and yeah. it's, it's <laughs> painful I had a person say you know growth is inevitable inescapable but ultimately satisfying mm-hmm. and I love that it's just not a it's not a pretty journey but the destination yeah. of where that is and the path it puts you on is also amazing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, we, and we talked a little bit about this with Toby Thomas because that, you know, to, to Lyris's point, there's, there's a point to the analog, right? There's some mission, something, but, you know, it's not explicitly stated anywhere that, oh, by the way, you got to learn to get to trust and get along with these other people and develop relationships and but it should be, I feel like, you know, like that, the, the whole point is we're going to send what four people out on these deep space missions, they're going to be their own little society. Um, and hopefully they've trained long enough here on earth to be ready to do that, right? So hopefully they've gone through the process that you, you, you're going through, which is sort of the self-awareness, this understanding of myself, but then now, uh, and the lyrics you talk about trust, um, 
previously, you know, how do we, like, that's an important piece so that, because we still, we're, we're still human. We, we all have biases and it's going to, they're going to come out. Like we can't ignore it just because, <laughs> it, you know, we've got PhDs or we're experts in this discipline or whatever it is. Like that stuff is still there. And so like how moving through your career, through your life, uh, you, you talk about space culture, right? Like what, what is that to you? And, and what, what's, what are we doing to build, to create that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I and mean, I think it actually, it probably started on the analog as well back at high seas, um, where I realized that analogs and the space are really great fertile grounds for figuring this stuff out because you don't have all of the social norms that are usually in a society and all of the different voices you, you're you're kind of in a little bit of a different environment and so you're able to kind of pick out things a little bit easier it's a little bit easier to kind of see that full thing and that's when I started becoming really interested with space culture and how are we doing this and that's you know I started working on myself but there's a larger piece to it um, that space one of, one of the reasons that people love space is it's it's a blank slate and that's i think actually probably we talk about space resources we talk about why we're going to space why are we spending all this money in space and there's a lot of really good answers in economics and you know you can dive into that but really i think the most valuable resource right now is this blank slate approach of we have things going here on here on earth that are not what i would like to see and i'm sure a lot of us can agree there's things that we just don't agree with there's a lot of um I'm going to just say anger. There's a lot of anger and pain in the world right now. And space, <laughs> there's not a lot of that in space right now. <laughs> so this is a chance for us to figure out how do we want to be as a species? How do we want humanity to be? And can we do that in space? And if we learn in space what that means and, and what that entails, we can start feeding that back to Earth. You hear a lot about the technologies that come out of space, um, memory foam mattresses, tennis shoes with certain souls, you hear all that stuff. And that's kind of exactly what I'm pointing to right now is um, the technologies, but not just the technologies, the culture that we test out in space. And then we watch it come back to earth and kind of flood our mindset of how we treat each other. Hmm. That's fascinating. I've never thought about that. There, there was a, recently there was a, a show, um, was it on sci-fi? It was, it was almost this exact concept of, you know, the earth was, you know, it was bad, right? The environment, mm -hmm. everything was really bad, wars, all this kind of stuff. And so they created a, a colony on the moon mm -hmm. to sort of reboot society and eventually bring that back in the hopes that it would make us better. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but inevitably, human things happen up there. But anyway, it, 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 that's a really interesting. It's concept. a drama, right? It has to I, exactly right. You gotta have a little. You gotta have a murder. You gotta have a murder. Um, but that—that's. Oh man, I hadn't thought about that. That's really, really fascinating. I mean, that sort of gets into like the the philosophy stuff, Jason. That you know you explore because um, it's like it's it's almost like it's two different things, right? Two halves, mm -hmm. and we're only focusing on the the technical half. And we're almost forgetting this, which is why it's so great that you're doing what you're doing. We need more of that. Mm -hmm. well, the technical part is the easy part. Yeah. <laughs> but, it's hard. Yeah. Trust me. It's hard. Yeah. It is. It's very hard. And then the human part is much harder. It's yeah. even harder. There's so many other variables. Yeah. What were you going to say, Jason? Oh, I was just going to actually hop on over and talk a little bit more about, have you shared about the bracelets yet? I have not. Yeah. I, I can do that now. So for everyone listening, we had a little bit of a pre-conversation and you should have been in the room when Alira's held up her bracelets and Bailey realized she didn't have a break. I mean, her bracelet on her beads and raced off. And I mean, there was a lot of energy in about five seconds. <laughs> and this is actually, you wouldn't think beads in regards to space. What's that about? But Bailey's got a really interesting initiative here, which I think allows us to kind of focus what we're talking about right here, because it is making that human connection very tangible. 
which is actually a lot harder than people realize because it is in the philosophical, it is in a way in the ethereal. And a lot of people reject it. I mean, this is the philosophical thing because it isn't tangible because no matter how hard we do, it is almost impossible to assign every aspect of the human inner experience and inter experience to a set of numbers in a grid and people get nervous if you can't do that if it can't be locked down um so ba bailey tell us about the beats because I, I was fascinated by that yeah of course so as i mentioned i've kind of taken this um very personal like i feel a personal ownership in helping design the space culture because if we don't take a a very um, intentional step towards that space culture is going to be like the culture we're going to do what we know best which is here on earth and as i just mentioned there's so much potential to be even better so i'm trying to take a very intentional step of like okay this is how i want to contribute to space culture um so i started thinking through what that could be and i knew i had a really good uh opportunity at the analog astronaut conference to bring ideas forward the analog astronaut conference is a very um diverse an understanding, excited group of people who come together. Um, and it's just like a very magical conference. Like I know that, that sounds weird, but it's a very magical conference. You leave feeling refreshed. And um, so I knew this was a good opportunity. So I started thinking about what I could do. Um, I brought in two cultures that I very much respect. Uh, the first one is, uh, I guess, Buddhism, Taoism, that area. That's an area that I've been really exploring in my own journey and part of my spirituality. And uh, I found Tibetan beads, so I'm holding up mine. I don't know if you guys do videos or not, but uh, yeah. I've got my two of my Tibetan beads on here. And um, it actually comes from these, these beads, the mala beads over here, um, which are meditation beads. There's 108 of them, and you meditate. Every time you use a mantra, you move a bead down. And so that's how you kind of keep in a meditative state. And so I always wore these. And I wanted to share this, but this is a lot. This is 108 beads. So I found these Tibetan beads. And I decided to bring them to the conference to share. And then I went one step for further and I brought in um, rave culture, which is not the culture you typically think of in space, but they do something that I very much appreciate. When you meet someone at a rave, you exchange uh, candy. It's called candy. And it's like the little plastic perler beads or whatever they're called. Um, and you can make your own and, and it's a really endearing kind of um, exchange. And so I wanted to bring this mindfulness Tibetan beads to the connection that the rave culture was bringing. And in rave culture, what you do when you meet someone at these raves and you connect with them, um, th there's a specific, as, as mentioned, there's a specific thing of you do peace where you put two fingers together um, and you're doing this with someone else. I'm doing it with myself right now, but peace. And then you do love where you make a heart. And then you do um, unity where you grasp hands. And then respect is when the person who is giving the bead while the hands are grasped, will transfer the bead to the other person's wrist. And mm -hmm. so it's a very, it's a way, it's, it's called PLUR, P-L-U-R, uh, peace, love, unity, respect. And that just really spoke to me as if you connect with someone, you want them to know that you value them, you love their story, you love, you, you appreciated meeting them and, and having that experience with them. And I think peace, love, unity, respect is a great way to show that. And so basically that's what I did at the conference. Uh, as I met people, I mean, I knew so many already, so it was really easy to be like, yeah, we already have a connection. But as I met people, I said, I would give them a bead. Sometimes I'd give them two because I want this to spread. And then it was just an amazing experience to watch because the first night I gave out maybe three beads. And the next day I gave out maybe like 15, 20. And by the end of the conference, I think everyone had at least one bead on. Um, and some of them were people I had not given a bead to. So I knew it was being spread by other people. And it was actually very tangible watching this, like, kind of overarch the whole conference. And people were really excited about it. And you could see as they made a connection, if, if it was a meaningful connection to them, they would give this bead. And some people had, like, three beads. And it was just amazing to kind of watch it kind of spread out through the conference. Um, as my own little, like, test analog experiment, I would say it was successful. Uh, and my goal is that this is like at every conference, you can see someone wearing beads and it's just like a, a safe, like, oh, you're, you're, you're someone who 
um, understands vulnerability and understands human connection. And you're someone that I can go up to and, and talk about. Now I have this piece that I can even break the ice with. Um, and that's kind of what I saw as the goal of just being very intentional with that kind of human connection that we're missing in the, uh, in the world. I was going to say the industry, but I think the world is better. Uh, yeah. That's yeah, and, I, and I was very proud to show her that I had. <laughs> and the thing about it is, you know, and specifically speaking in space is like the individuals, as we talked earlier, you know, they're engineers. It's about the machine and it's about the human in the loop in this engineering system and to be vulnerable to touch someone. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the thing that impressed me. It's like you have to touch someone to get the bead. You have to look them in the eye to get the bead to make that connection. And that's very uncomfortable in, in this industry or you know, when you talk with engineers and things like that, because connection is something that's not tangible. But here's a way to make it tangible and I love it. And mm -hmm. I also like to match outfits to my beads. So, <laughs> you know, that. I, I love that part of it. But I just really appreciate that effort and that small step and just how welcoming people are to it. And I think a lot of people were surprised too. It's like, oh, okay, I am connected to someone. Someone saw me. Yeah. I think it's a big piece of it as well. It's like someone saw me and thought enough of me to give me the beads. And I, that's what I think about Bailey when I put on my beads too. Oh, I love that. I, I was actually curious as to your experience being on the other side. I knew what I was doing. I was going in with this initiative. Like, what was your experience on the other side of it? Well, one, a little surprised, you know, because <laughs> here I am and I'm, and I'm surprised because this is what I want to do. I want to see happen. And so that was a good thing. And to see someone taking the initiative to do it, but my own personal experience is like, oh, it gave me another level of connection to the culture not being, because I feel like I am a little bit of an outsider coming in and doing research, because whenever you say psychological research, people just like, whoa, <laughs> um, that's someone else's job, it's not mine, I don't want to talk about it, you know, it just, it gets intimidating anytime you bring in that mind, um, the, the psychological piece of it, so this was another step of welcoming me in and being part of the culture. And that's what I liked about it. You know, uh, I, I enjoyed seeing other people um, experience that too and just see their minds start to be like, oh, okay. You know, when you look at it, it forces you to think about how you got it and what it means that you do have it. I love that. And that's, this, that was yeah. exactly my goal. Like that, I'm so glad that worked in that direction for you. Cause that was what I wanted. And like, I didn't even think about it, but being able to look at it and say, Oh, I am connected. I do belong here. I am part of this community. That was something that is so missing. Like it, it's so easy to feel isolated in what we do and for it to be like a, a physical reminder of that. I'm so, I didn't even think about that, but I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, I mean, we need to we we need to make this a thing. I love this. I, I think it, it's that tangible piece uh, that you all mentioned, and and also because you know, oftentimes the, these big type of type of initiatives, right? They start out of fear, right? Like China is a conversation mm -hmm. that everybody's having about, and 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 what I feel like is pushing a lot of direction into space because we, we got to get there first kind of thing mm -hmm. um and that that to me is not necessarily the right reason it's built go, out of fear right? yeah exactly yeah. so how do we combat that and i this to me is um man that's super powerful like we gotta we gotta do this at every conference even if you're not there how do we yeah. take this movement the plur movement or whatever we, you know and and i think we got to do this is what I'm saying. So if you guys will help me with it, yeah, if you guys will help me with it, I was thinking about this. I need to yes. get my suppliers so that I can open up like my own store so you can buy yes. not just one. That's that's one thing that I was worried about with this conference is if you only have one, you don't want to give it away. It's special. Right. You don't want to. Yeah. So you need to have tens, hundreds so that you feel comfortable giving them yes. away and, and just spreading that love. Yeah. Um, and, and I will say one thing with this, this culture from the rave culture um, that so you share the ones you want to share on your right hand 
and that's when you shake someone's hand that's the other thing you can do is if you shake someone's hand you can mm. transfer it that way but so the ones you're sharing is on the right hand and then the ones that are meaningful to you are in your left one so that they always stay with you because you never extend your left hand so um and, and actually one story from this whole experience i was giving these beads there was a really sweet woman named mary lou she gave her her beads that she happened to have on back. Like she had a different set of beads mm. that she valued and she gave one back to me. I'm, I'm not wearing mine right now. I should be. And something like that, that was the first time I ever received beads back. I had been mm. giving beads, but I'd never received beads. And so that one will always be on my left wrist mm -hmm. as like, I will never give this one away. This is very special to me. And so people will probably keep like, for example, like if it was their first beads they got from someone or for me, obviously, like in this case, that's something you might keep on your left wrist because it's meaningful. And then you have hundreds of them that you can share on your right wrist and make a meaningful, someone will move one of your beads to their left wrist because mm, it was meaningful yeah. to them. Oh, cool. Yeah, I we'll help you. Left. We'll help. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're in. We're down. <laughs> we're in. We All right, we'll get it going, guys. I'll, I'll figure out how to get this out bigger so that people can buy their own so that they can spread yeah. it. Yeah. Well, because even, I mean, because then, you know, obviously, the round beads lend themselves to very space focused uh, themes, right? I don't know if they mm -hmm. have to be a certain type of bead, but could you design your own beads, right? Or create your own bracelet that mm -hmm. then that, that's a symbol of you that you're also oh, sharing with somebody. And you give a piece of you, yeah, like your design. Exactly. Oh, I love yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> Great. Okay. I'm, I'm in, guys. Let's do it. Let's do it. Well, Definitely. I think this is. I think this is a great way to end this conversation, which could go on forever, obviously. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> Bailey, man, thank you so very much. Like, it's awesome. Everything you're doing. Um, Everything. You know, it's fun to see you at all the conferences and see you everywhere, which is great. That's what we need, right? We need more of that. Um, we need more people to get involved like that. So thank you for being here. Well, thank Definitely. you guys for doing this, putting this together so that everyone can hear all the different stories. Like, you guys are... You're doing the same thing. It's been such an honor just to meet you guys and be part of your circle. So thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. And I, I must say, Bailey, your energy is always um, palatable. Yes. I, when I went <laughs> to the conference, I was like, that's Bailey. Yep. That's what we <laughs> and not right? to put any pressure on you because that is pressure yeah. to mm -hmm. know being known as a person with energy because sometimes you don't have that energy, right? You just talked about mm -hmm. that. How do you regenerate yourself? But I love that you're sharing and we're so grateful that you shared it with us today. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for allowing me to be part of this community in this sense. I appreciate it. Very well. <laughs> and thank you all for, for yeah. watching. Really appreciate it. Yeah, that it. too. Yeah. Everyone else out there. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Join the fun. Look for your beads soon. Yep. Thank you. Everyone. Bye. 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 Take care. Thank you.